wise mind is always kind, always gentle. We see that when you bathe a person in kindness and gentleness, you shift all the neurophysiology. You shift yourself out of toxic stress into healthy stress. So 1,400 plus neurophysiological responses will work for you. So if I'm sitting in my wise mind and I'm looking at this relationship mess, which is in the messy chair, and I'm saying, okay, that's not who I am. That's because of, and I'm going to immerse myself in kindness. So the first thing I'm, I'm saying here, Tim, which is so important, is you have to rebuild your identity, your self-esteem, your value system. You have to understand that that is not who you are. Hey, Insider, we have a special interview for you today featuring a world-renowned communication pathologist and cognitive neuroscientist, Dr. Caroline Leaf. Since the early 1980s, she has studied and researched the mind-brain connection. And during her years in clinical practice as a communication pathologist, she developed tools and processes that help people develop and change their thinking and subsequent behavior. Her scientific techniques have literally transformed the lives of patients with traumatic brain injury, learning disabilities, and emotional traumas. So if you're wanting to discover how you can truly heal your past and start creating the future you truly deserve, be sure to listen very attentively to the wealth of wisdom that's scattered throughout today's interview. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this special interview episode featuring Dr. Caroline Leaf. What originally motivated you to get into this work in the first place and really mastering this craft? Well, um, it began 38 years ago. I've been, been in the field for almost four decades now. And it began, as, as she's a child, I always had such a passion for the brain and I was going to become a brain surgeon. That was my goal. And I was in, got into med school and everything. And I was sitting in a neuroscience lecture and the lecturer, the lecturer said, your brain can't change and you've got to teach your patients to compensate. And that was in the 80s when they didn't believe that the brain could change. And something just did not ring true because at that stage, they also still spoke about the mind and the brain being separate. And I said, well, if our mind is always changing because our mind's how we experience life and the mind is using the brain, the brain must change. So the professor said to me, oh, well, that's a ridiculous question, but you know what, go do research. And I did a TED talk on this and I began with doing research with people with traumatic brain injuries. And long story short, I ended up doing some of the first neuroplasticity research in my field neuroplasticity being the ability of the mind to change the brain, that the brain isn't this inflexible, solid thing. It actually changes as our mind changes. And that spurred my research, seeing people with traumatic brain injuries and dementias and Alzheimer's and severe learning disabilities and extreme trauma from war or sexual abuse or whatever, seeing them being able to actually get, get their mind together, sort of get into this wise mind and direct the neuroplasticity of the brain just drove me. So I practiced clinically for 25 years and I've always done research. I still do research. We're busy with another massive trial now. And it's just constantly trying to understand better ways of helping people understand the mind and the impact of mind on how we function. Right. So I heard you say the mind changes the brain, basically. Yes. So before we start going deep into that, uh, what is the difference between the mind and the brain? Great place to start, and it always grabs people's attention, because if you think of the current narrative, when people talk about mind, they talk about brain. You know, they kind of use it as one word, and that's, that is the current narrative, but it's incorrect scientifically. And we can go right back to 150 years of scientific research in this field. We can go back thousands of years into the ancient texts. And we'll see that whether they're the scientific ones, philosophical ones, religious ones, we'll see there's always been a distinction between mind and brain. So the easiest way to, to understand this is to think of the fact that you and I are alive. We can have this conversation. If we had a dead person sitting next to us, they couldn't do anything. Their brain and body would be in the process of disintegrating. So the difference between you and I and a dead person is this aliveness, this mind. Mind is this aliveness, this ability to experience this conversation, the ability to experience whatever it is that you do from here, the ability from the moment you open your eyes to the moment you go to sleep to take everything that you experience and you that with your mind and put that into your brain. And even when you're sleeping, your mind is the thing that is actually sorting out what you've been experiencing during the day, is guiding the regeneration of the body. The mind drives every second. We're making about a million cells every second. The mind is driving that. So mind is this force, this, and can be described on two levels. The one level is sort of a psychological level, which is the easy one to understand. So mind is our ability to respond to life, our ability to think and feel and choose in response to the experiences of life, which is what everyone's doing now. It's kind of this filter that takes what's coming in and makes sense of it and puts it into the brain. 
The other part of mind is it's an energetic force. It's um, There's a tremendous amount of work that's been done in, on gravitational fields, and we all understand gravity. You would float if we didn't have gravity. But we also have unique gravitational fields that surround us and move through our bodies. And these are also related to electromagnetic forces. Einstein work on, Einstein's work on photons many years ago. So what we see is that humans have this energetic force that is moving around and through the body. And it's unique to each of us. And that's what energizes the body. That's what we're picking up with an EEG and a QE, QEEG and an ECT and all these different things. And um, sorry, an e, a Q, a e, I mean, e, EKG on your heart and any kind of um, measurement that we're taking where we see movement and life and energy, we're seeing that that is mind driving. When someone dies, all of that goes and we weigh less when we die. As soon as we die, there's a slight weight change. So what all that means is massive implications and discussions. But essentially, in a nutshell, your mind is your driving force. Your mind energizes your brain and your body. Your brain and body are reliant on the mind to actually do what, do what they do. So the mind and the, uh, the brain and the body are responders. The mind is the driver and the experiencer. And so that's why I've studied that connection, and we call it psycho neurobiology, mind, brain, body, and its connection, its relationship, the feedback loop, and what kind of level of control do we have? Right. So is it kind of like the brain and the body is like the vehicle and the mind is the driver, you're saying? Yeah, you could say it like that. That's a great way of saying it. It's the, it's the driver, the energizing force. It makes the brain and the body work. Always come back to the example of if you're dead, your brain and body are disintegrating. But when you're alive, we are doing stuff and there's stuff happening. There's a response happening in our brain and our body, which isn't there. So mind is that force, that complicated force that has is that energetic, all the sort of physics side, plus it's the psychological side, the two together. I want to know from uh, your side, what, what do you define as mental mess and how can we most easily get started on really cleaning up our mental mess? So that's a, that's a good question too. All these years of experience of working with people and now we reach millions with my platform, what has happened over the, especially the last 40 years, is that people are seeing emotions as illnesses. So if anyone has something like a depression or anxiety or frustration or irritation, or they get, you know, feel overwhelmed or burnt out, people feel like there's something wrong with them. But that's that's dangerous because as soon as you feel that there's something wrong with them, your self-esteem, your value systems, your everything that sort of drives you starts becoming challenged and then it just gets worse. So what I looked at in the science was what are we, how are we actually physically made and mentally made? And we see that we wired for love. And what that means, it's scientists actually, Nobel Prize winning scientists use that phrase. What that means is that our brain and our body, and I'm holding up the model here, the brain and the body are wired for survival. Everything about your brain and your body is wired to help you. So if something goes wrong, like a virus enters your body, or you have damage, or you have a tumor, or you have a toxic issue happening to you, that all challenges this wired for love nature and anything that challenges our survival, our immune system and all our body systems work together to fight that. We, know, we see this so clearly now over the pandemic. We've really got an understanding of this really nicely. Thoughts do the same thing. Toxic experiences also challenge the body. So basically, with that now, that's sort of the foundation to that, aunt, that question. Now, here we are as humans in life. And because we can't predict what's going to happen and because we can't control events, circumstances, people or what people do to us or we do to people, there's a messiness in life. And that messiness means that there's adverse circumstances that we're going to experience. And these are happening daily and obviously to various de varying de degrees. So it may be that you have a bad post on social media, which would maybe be a one, or you have a, an extreme abuse, like a loss of a loved one, uh, which would be a 10. So every day we shuffle between these adverse circumstances from having a little minor irritation to a major thing. Now we don't have major things every day, but we will have in cycles of five years, we will have various major life events that affect us. But daily we are dealing with stuff. And also we have our past that has also already happened and is also filled with all these, these traumas and baseline traumas and everything. So all of that is messy. Now our brain and our body and our mind are actually pretty good at handling that, pretty good at you know helping make us aware and, and we to a certain extent respond and deal with it. 
But to a large extent, we've over over time, as especially in this technological age and with the advances of how we've become so physically oriented with the advances in brain science, we've become less focused on the mind side. This what peace is, what happiness, what that internal state of you know joy, all those kind of things that that are so important to being a human. Those haven't had as much attention as they should have, and so we've become so physically focused that it's oh my brain made me do it. So now if someone has a mess, if they have some depression. It's now immediately labeled as a disease. Something physical is wrong with your brain. Meanwhile, an emotion isn't an it. You can't have depression. You can experience depression as an as a messenger or warning signal. So the diff- so the mess that I'm talking about is we've actually got to embrace the mess. It's okay to be messy. It's very normal. Humans will experience adverse circumstances. Our brain, mind, and body are, ex- are experimental. We've got this messy mind that is trying to listen to the wise part of us, and it's and we not knowing how to react because we don't know what's coming up next. And this one shouts at you and you react or that happens and you do your best in the moment and you see it didn't work. So you try and manage that. So that experimental process of brain and body can handle. What we can't handle is staying in the mess. We don't have the, the, the neurophysiology to stay in the mess. So if we have this toxic situation and something, our brain, our, let's say that we um, multiple abusive situations, maybe in a marriage or something, so it just doesn't stop. So initially as it starts, it is a, your brain and body will change accordingly. We can talk about that in a moment. But then your immune system will start fighting that, that response that our brain and body are experiencing, to not to fight you, but to help you to survive through that. But if the source, is not controlled if you don't deal with the source so you, you're not going to the synthesis is alive all the time like a volcano it's a, in a volcano where the source just keeps coming so the volcano just keeps erupting that's a messiness that's not managed so we want to manage the mess we want to find the source of the volcano and we want to let it erupt and then we want to let the lava cool down so that we can heal and grow back again grow the green grass over the remineralized soil and that's the mess i'm talking about So the only way we can cut the volcano at the source is by allowing ourselves to be messy, embracing the messiness. And as we embrace the messiness, that's when we can can deconstruct and reconstruct. So that's kind of the basic principle that's operating. And it's in, as I'm saying it, it's, in, it's instinct, but we're not practicing like this in our current psychiatric and mental health model. That's not what, being, what is really being practiced enough. Okay. So am I right in saying what you've got this messy mind are these uh, survival-based emotions, anxiety, uh, fear, negative thinking, these sort of thoughts and feelings? Yes, yes. Okay. So basically what we see, and my, my research has shown us this, lots and lots of research. In fact, there was a great study that came out of Tokyo and Texas University, a combined study, where we we look at the Eastern philosophy looks at emotions as messengers. The Western philosophy looks at emotions as illnesses. And there's two distinct ways of looking and and looking at an emotion, which is actually one of the most beautiful messengers that you can use to grow as a person. If you see them as 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 an illness, then you then they're seen as a symptom to suppress. Now, you can't suppress anything because they're volcanic in nature. So the more you try and suppress, the worse you'll get. But if you embrace for the message, you say embrace the messiness, that's how you will get through the messiness. And that's been the philosophy, foundational philosophy of my, of my work is what's the mess? How can we repair and grow? Yeah. And how do you do that? Love it. So how can you extract the message from the mess? So... The every um, so the easiest way to understand the mess is that it comes in the form of signals, and those signals are protective signals that are coming from your combined mind brain body interaction, so your psycho neurobiology. So we've got to come back to our basics of the brain and body. It's working for you. It's your friend. It's not your enemy, and your mind is not your enemy. Our mind. Now, so there's three parts. Now think of your mind as having two parts: the wise mind and the messy mind. And the way to understand that is to think of, okay, if my brain and body, if all my organs are designed to work for me, all my systems, then my mind that's driving that's also designed to work for me. So what we see, and there's a lot of work in physics has shown this, that they, that you, when people are angry, um, you, can, you can pick up 
that that kind of vibration is very toxic. You know, the the frequency wave and um, the a love wave, for example. And I'm not trying to talk all ethereal. This is very hardcore science. I'm a scientist. But when we talk about a wave that has the right kind of frequency, we we can talk talk about that as a love wave. And that love wave brings health and healing to the body. So when people are meditating, when people are forgiving, when people are focusing on on joy and peace, when people are being kind and gentle, all that kind of stuff, we see that there's a very natural alignment of this flow through the body. And we see that when, and it's, it's a very powerful force, um, when someone is angry and frustrated, it's a very erratic wave. It's And interestingly enough, it's, it's five times less strong than the love wave. So the, the, the natural uh, wired for love optimism bias we have as humans is stronger. But we can, because we have choice, we have free will, we can over, we have veto power. We can override any kind of love wiseness for messiness. We can get so consumed by it. Okay, so that's just also foundational to that question. So now how do we tune into our messiness? The messiness, first of all, as it is, is, as I said, is a messenger. So what we've got to do is kind of start at the top. Look at your patterns in your life. It's very practical. Tune in. What Tune into yourself, like even in this moment, the listeners can do this right now. What is the most overriding thing that you feel is blocking your peace? Chaos, life is chaotic. So let's just face it, it's chaos and there's a little bit of order in between. But what is the what is the main thing that you feel is a pattern in your life that is blocking you having peace in the midst of chaos? And if you can, you know, sort of think about that, there may be four or five things. And if there's four or five things, just kind of get them in order in your mind and say, okay, well, there's these, this, 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 but maybe it's all the same thing, or maybe this is the worst one. And I kind of have that conversation with yourself. So now look for a pattern, look for this pattern. And that pattern is going to have characteristics. And those characteristics will be, what are your behaviors? What are the behaviors of that pattern? So if things like maybe you're withdrawing more, or maybe your creativity is dropped off at work, or maybe you're just getting so frustrated all the time, or maybe whatever. So what are your behaviors that you know instinctively aren't working for you, but they kind of just manifest and they, that's how you're showing up at the moment. Then look at your emotions. So the emotions, I mean, these are all beautiful things. These are all messengers that I'm describing. So is it is, is there depression? Is that depression sliding down towards the 10 instead of sort of towards the one, two, three, four, which is kind of manageable? Is it maybe anxiety as well? Is it maybe frustration, anger, irritation? All, look at those. Then look at your body. What is your body feeling? Because and and we can circle back after this question and talk about where what thoughts and memories are and why why we need to look in our body. But basically, those memories are in your brain and your body. So your body is also going to be telling you, you know, the GI symptom, the sore foot, whatever. These are all telling you something. So what are your symptoms? Because if you focus on that pattern, you will start being able to associate emotions, behaviors body symptoms and perspective that's the fourth signal or the fourth clue and that so what is your perspective life sucks i just can't do this or so what is your overarching those are the over so those are the four signals and, and kind of find the overarching pattern you're not going to find everything immediately but you'll get a basic description now that pattern then is coming from something and that something is a thought and a thought is a very real thing and a thought is the product of the mind and the mind is involved in our experiences, as I said right at the beginning. So however I show up my patterns is because of a thought that I built in response to an experience. So basically, you can track back from your pattern to your signals. You're tuning in deeper, deeper, and then you can start moving through a cycle where you can deconstruct and reconstruct. And then you do that over time. And we can you know, add go into the detail more, but I'm kind of giving you the big picture. So it's a matter of tuning in. It's a deliberate and intentional mind work. Now, that ability to tune in from the pattern to the signals to the thought and then deconstruct and reconstruct that thought is basically mind work. And that's your mind, wise mind talking to your messy mind and giving your messy mind permission to be messy in order to repair the mess and to grow. And that's something we as humans are actually quite good at. It's self-regulation. I call it self-regulated mind management. And that's something that we are, it's in our, it's in our wiring, it's in our mind-brain-body connection. What we don't always do is develop it to the level that we should. And as, as we spend time developing that, that's when we start seeing changes in our life. So people that do a lot of meditation, for example, and meditation is only one part of, of, of what I teach, 
but um, it's it's brain preparation. But you'll find people that do do that and practice those kind of things or are practicing being more mindful. Those are elements that they start seeing the kind of thing that I'm talking about. They start seeing the mess for what it is, not that it's you, because you're amazing. You are wired for love. You have this incredible body. There's something you can do that no one else can do. That's who you are at your core. So the way you show up those patterns, that isn't you. That is you because of. So what we need to do is manage that, find the because of, change it around, repair and grow. And that's what life is. It's a cycle of doing these things all the time. And Mm -hmm. it's a deliberate, intentional practice to get into that way of working. Right. Firstly, that's incredibly powerful. Uh, I want to, of course, ask tons of questions to do this. So First. in terms of the thoughts, in terms of the thoughts, is is one of the signs, it could be like a, like a thought that's really given you that clue to the message, a recurring, is one of the signs uh, that it could be is it's just a recurring negative thought or does it go deep in that? Yes. No, you're quite right. So in, intrusive thoughts, 96% of people, I actually think it's 100% personally, of people battle with intrusive thoughts. Some of us have just known how to keep them quiet better than others. But they're there. They're very, they're very good messengers. You see, we have a non-conscious mind. And in our non-conscious mind, which operates 24-7, that's where our intelligence and is driving us. And that's where every experience you've ever had is very much active. And it looks like one, it looks different in the different parts of the mind, brain, and body. So just to answer your question directly, and then we can dive into the detail, the the um, the thoughts that keep popping up, those are your non-conscious mind sending thoughts through your subconscious into your conscious mind to say, pay attention. They're like little warning signals. And we need to become thought detectives. We need to shift our perspective. If we have a thought that popping up, that is definitely part of that pattern. Because if you look at that thought that keeps coming up and you actually grab it, you'll see what are the emotions? What are the behaviors? What are my body reactions? What is my perspective around that thought? Mm -hmm. So sometimes the thought that keeps repeatedly popping up, when you grab it, will lead you to the pattern. And then the pattern leads you back to the thought so that you can actually deconstruct the thought. So we've got to really self-regulate. And I wanted to know as a neuroscientist, how can we, is it possible when we consciously awake, um, can we do this? How often can we do this? And the research shows that you can do this every 10 seconds. So literally, and that doesn't mean I'm going to look at my watch every 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. What it means translated into practical terms is that while we're awake, we can self-regulate all the time. I can constantly control my reactions by, as I'm speaking to you now, what are my facial expressions? What are the responses on your face? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Is it clear enough? If I go into a conversation with my husband or my kids from here, how am I conducting myself? What is the impact on me and on others? How am I handling that email, this business conversation? That's the kind of life that I have trained myself and my patients to live. And I show with my research that when you do that, you become 81 percent more effective at then managing those intrusive thoughts by finding the pattern and then reverting back to the the root of the thought, which is the because of. Because everything we do is because of something. Mm -hmm. You know, everything, our attitude to money, our attitude to relationships, our attitude to politics, our attitude to anything is coming from a because of. And those because of sometimes are very destructive and need to be changed. Mm -hmm. You know, they become those limiting beliefs and behaviors and so on. Is because of the message or is it separate? The, me- the message is inside of those signals. Okay. So the yeah. message, so the message, so think of yourself as being a detective, a thought detective, yeah. a self-regulated thought detective that constantly you're watching how you as a person, how's Tim functioning and how am I functioning? And if it's great, like you're doing a great interview, you're very, you're brilliant with the interviews and things. This is good. You grow that. But if there's something that's disruptive, you're going to grab that and say, okay, why? Because that's that's stealing from my peace. And not only is it stealing from my peace, that's toxic to my brain and my body. And it's putting my million cells I make every second at risk of not being good quality. So therefore my body's losing quality, which means my vulnerability to disease is increasing, which means my immune system is is reducing in its power and all that kind of stuff. So it's having this very holistic kind of approach. The message is so important. We listen to that message Mm. because the message is telling us to listen to find the because of the root. Yeah. So let's say somebody watching this right now has located the thought, the intrusive thought or the recurring thought. Um, What can they do to really most easily locate the because of? Okay. 
brilliant question. So now I'm going to use more props. So if I may, to answer that, we need to talk about what a thought is. People think thoughts are these. That I don't know what people think thoughts, but most people, from my experience, think that thoughts are these things that keep popping in my mind and make my mind a mess. So there's a lot of confusion around the word mind, thought, memory, emotions, etc. So if I could quickly unpack that, then that will make the finding of the because of so easy. Mm-hmm. So as we're talking now, let's use this experience of this podcast as the experience that we are building, as, 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 as the sort of teaching tool to understand what a thought is. So you and I are talking, as you introduced me, you laid a seed. Now, we know when we grow a plant, you put the seed in the ground, the roots grow, the trunk grows, the branches grow. That's exactly what's happening now. As you introduce the podcast, or as the person read the title of the podcast and press play, that was the seed sown. And as they heard the introduction, then we're starting to communicate. You're asking me questions and I'm giving information in response. So I'm sending out auditory sound waves, electromagnetic light waves, and the people listening, all your listeners and viewers are receiving this through their mind. They are on a psychological level, thinking, feeling, and choosing about what I'm saying at 400 billion actions plus per second. It's actually at about 10 to the 27, which is an inconceivable number. And then at the same time, their physics, all the gravitational fields and electromagnetic forces are all working. And all of this is being received and pushed into the brain. So I'm going to use a bigger model of a brain and I'm holding up a brain for the listeners inside. It's a model of the brain. And this information is coming into the brain. As soon as this information's energy field hits the brain, the brain responds electromagnetically, neurochemically, um, on a quantum level and genetically. And that reaction causes proteins to form amino acids are made and they group to form proteins and those proteins are grouped together to form branches and you start growing a tree so a thought is literally a tree made of proteins this is neuroplasticity so what i've just described is the process of neuroplasticity the mind changing the structure of the brain so every moment of every day we as humans are changing the structure of our brain in two directions a healthy direction, so a healthy plant, and here's a toxic looking tree. In a, it's a wire, this wiry looking tree, and I use these as analogies. Um, in, it, so this is known as the plastic paradox that we always change our brain because we always respond with our mind. But if it's toxic, we build a toxic tree, which is damaging to the brain and body. If it's healthy or, and we're managing it, we build a healthy thought. So let's talk about the healthy thought because this conversation is very healthy. This is good stuff. So now let's quickly. Talk about the structure because this is very important to the because of. The root structure over here, the roots in in the pot, that is what I'm saying. And it's your questions and it's our, our back and forth. So it's the source. So the source of this podcast is our conversation. And that's going into the root system. So as people are listening, doing this mind, energy, brain response, the first thing that builds is the root. And then literally simultaneously, it's very, very fast. This We grow a little trunk and the branches that you see above ground, all these little branches, which are proteins, which are holding my words and your words in vibrations, these are the interpretation. So you, the way you understand what I'm saying and the way all your listeners understand what I'm saying is completely different. So everyone has a unique perception of what I'm saying. The root system is the same. But the way it's being interpreted is unique to each person. So your thinking, feeling, and choosing about what I'm saying is different to every listener that's listening to to us and watching us. And so this is your interpretation. And this is the beauty because this root plus this interpretation creates a uniqueness that only Tim brings to the table. And therefore, what you do with this will impact the world in only the way that you can impact the world. So we need your interpretation of this to impact the world in the way that only you can, which then completes your role in the world because it's not about you it's about you in the world and that's then enhancing it's an enhancing culture we everything you do enhances everyone else so there's no competition in this philosophy because Mm. i can't do what you can do i can only enhance you you can only enhance me and when we enhance each other we build our intelligence so this Mm. is what this is going to show up as a very healthy tim doing great interviews and, and impacting the world in the way that only you can but now let's say that there's a toxic experience like someone's been bullied in a marriage which or someone's had has repeated sexual abuse or someone's had terrible trauma during COVID, one death after another, one illness, loss of finance or whatever it may be, the loneliness, etc. cetera. Um, so that is now that root system. The experience is always the root system. So the because of is the source. The because of in this discussion is what I'm saying. You are learning more about your brain, mind and body because of what we're saying. So this because of is 
good because of. This because of is toxic, but we need to find it because this because of is creating a distorted processing and a very distorted in interpretation of oneself. So let's say that this particular person potentially was abused as a child and now goes into abusive relationships, which is very often the pattern because the interpretation of the person is that I don't deserve more. I deserve to be controlled, to be hurt, to be. So the interpretation is distorted because the experience was distorted. This will show up in a pattern of broken relationships or feelings of I can't ever make it work or I'm always, everyone's always leaving me or this is just, I'm a disaster. I'm not worth loving. Um, I hate myself, all that kind of thing, which leads to all kinds of other stuff. So that pattern and for a certain amount of time, we can actually kind of push these down and suppress them. But because they're volcanic, every volcano eventually erupts. And if we don't chop off the source, as I said earlier on, it will keep erupting. Okay, so the because of now, because of understanding the structure, there's one more thing I need to explain. When we experience this podcast we're building it into our brain as these trees but as soon as we build it in our brain our brain sends an instruction to the rest of the body and all the rest of the cells of the brain and the body which collectively are somewhere between 37 and 100 trillion cells and this memory is also stored as a change in every single cell of our body which is so powerful which makes so much sense if you think of someone who recalls a traumatic event they feel it in their body it could be 10 years from the trauma, but that trigger goes off, that loud sound, the war trauma comes back, the whole body physically reacts. A child who's been abused when they're in a triggered situation, the whole body comes back. And this is why there's a lot around you know, yoga and somatic therapies and EMDR. And we've got to recognize that that thought's not just as data in the brain. It's also data in the body, in every cell of our body. And third place, in our mind, because we are psycho neurobiology, mind, brain, body. So the mind stores it as a gravitational field. So it's in three places. And to understand the mind storage, think of like if you watch a podcast and you see the little lines going up and down, think of that as kind of a visual, that little pattern is in the mind. So it's in three places. So this thought, this healthy one is in your brain, if you of your body and your mind is these healthy love waves and gravitational field with this content specific to the content. And this is what's now how you would show up. This is now also in three places, mind, brain, mind, the, the mind is the field, brain is the tree, body is the change in the gen genetic code. One more thing here. This is a tree. It's one tree. It's one concept. It's one pattern made up of lots of roots which is the because of, and lots of interpretation branches. So what all these branches are the memories. So thoughts and memories aren't the same thing. Thoughts are made of memories, root memories and, and interpretation memories. So this is the data. These are the what happened, the details, the data, the feelings, the emotions, which are the, basically the same thing. The, all the things that happened and the choices and all the stuff is stored in these two places, that the interpretation version. So thoughts are one, like a thought tree, like an apple tree with lots of apples on it. This is a thought tree with all the information on it. So to find the because of, this produces the pattern. And the pattern is what we spoke about earlier on. The pattern has signals. And those signals are coming from the non-conscious through the subconscious into the conscious mind. This non-conscious works 24-7. The subconscious and conscious only work when you're awake. Okay, so the non-conscious is the biggest part of our, our mind. So the non-conscious stores all of these things and has access to all the different levels and is forever trying to help you. It's forever trying to get the wise part of you to deal with the mess. So the wise part saying, okay, there's a mess. Let me send you a signal. Let me make you feel X in your body. So, so as this draws is, is awakened into the conscious mind, this data starts coming back. This then draws on all the body memory and then draws and then the mind kind of pulls the whole thing together. And so that comes out as the pattern, how we're showing up. And then that and the signals, the emotions, the behaviors, the body signal, signals and the perspective. So now we grab all of that and we start gathering awareness of it to deconstruct from the pattern and the signals to what's my interpretation? What was my processing? What is the because of? And how can I shift that? Because you can't change what's happened to you. It's happened, but you can change what's in you. This is in you, and this is toxic, and this is causing brain damage, and this is, over time, increases the vulnerability of the brain and the body, because this is affecting the quality of the cells we make every second. 
which is around about 810,000 to a million. So therefore, this has to go. This is the erupting volcano. And that's why your body is screaming at you, why your mind is screaming at you, why your brain is screaming at you through those patterns and those signals. So then you, you, know, you pay attention and you work through this process. And it's kind of like, and I'm going to stop because I know you've got questions and we can dive deeper. But essentially, it's like going into a garden of weeds. You can't just chop off the head which is what a lot of us are doing in this current day and age with the medication, with the, um, just a technique. You can't just do five gratitude statements and say, okay, I'm going to wake up every morning and every time I have a negative thought, I'm just going to look in the mirror and I'm going to say 10 positive things. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying 10 positive things, but if you are trying to do that to overcome this, you've just put a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. It won't work. Or another analogy, you've just cut the head off the weed. The weed will grow back. Mm. So until you've t- actually gone through the pain of, of the deconstruction and the reconstruction, changing how it plays out into you, you're constantly going to be driven by those intrusive thoughts and that pattern. And it's going to feel like it's part of you and it doesn't have to be part of you. Now, that's a long answer. And please go ahead and unpack and we can dissect <laughs> whatever you'd like to dissect. Okay. Um, Great can, you- <laughs> <laughs> can you give an example of uh, a because of some of these because of an example, sure. So let's say that, um, let's take the relationship one. So let's take, for example, that that um, there's a pattern in your life of relationships are just not great and you're desperate to form a, a, a good relationship and you find that, you know, in, intimate relationships are just not sustainable. They get to a certain point and they just crash. And even maybe work relationships and family relationships, things are just it's just not like what they should be. So the pattern is there and it's leading to the emotional. So there's the pattern relationship. So it's leading to the emotional signals if you tune in of mm-hmm. frustration, of sadness, of despair, of I'm lonely. Okay. Then just that's a few. Then let's look at the behaviors. Um, we, we, we very often will respond in a weird way because we, we want people, but we almost like get aggressive trying to force things. So maybe your behaviors are forceful and slightly aggressive or maybe very withdrawn. So we, everyone's different. There's no cookie cutter. If you have this emotion, you're going to have this behavior. Sometimes we shock ourselves with the emotions and behaviors that we have because these are so distorted that, and, and, our, and our wise minds looking at ourselves and saying, why am I doing that? And every time you have a moment like that, grab it because that's your wisdom. Go say, oh, okay, what are you saying, wise mind? You know, literally talk. I used to tell my patients, put two chairs next to each other and you sit in both chairs, you the wise mind and the messy mind and have a conversation with yourself. So in doing this relationship, finding the big cause of, have this beautiful conversation with yourself. Sit in the chairs, the wise mind. The wise mind is always kind always gentle. We see that when you bathe a person in kindness and gentleness, you shift all the neurophysiology. You shift yourself out of toxic stress into healthy stress. So 1400 plus neurophysiological responses will work for you. So if I'm sitting in my wise mind and I'm looking at this relationship mess, which is in the messy chair, and I'm saying, okay, that's not who I am. That's because of, and I'm going to immerse myself in kindness. So the first thing I'm, I'm saying here, Tim, which is so important, is you have to rebuild your identity, your self-esteem, your value system. You have to understand that that is not who you are. So you may have to spend 63 days, which is the more is the more or less cycle that is the the minimum time frame it takes to rewire neural pathways. Not 21. It takes three cycles of 21. At each stage, there's different things happening, and this is part of the research that I've done. Not much research in this field. Everyone thinks it takes 21 days to build a habit. Not at all. You have changes in 21 days, but they're not sustainable. Sustainability comes in cycles of 63 days. So you may have to for the first 63 days of this relationship discovery because of thing you may have to do 63 days and maybe multiple cycles of 63 days learning to believe in yourself again learning to tell yourself okay i'm like that because this one said this to me because this one so you may find your initial work in in this discovery is trying to just believe in yourself again seeing your interpretations of yourself are not true because of what was spoken and then you can start doing more uh, you know, so make go towards the changes you want to make okay so now what does it look like you so so basically you would sit down and you would plan to work for at least 63 days and open your mind to more you know because these things are generally very pervasive this is not just a one off thing you do five steps each day for the first 21 days you're going to do 
spend allocate around about 15 to 25 15 to 45 minutes I wouldn't do longer than 45 my research and others re other research has shown that when you're dealing with deep emotional stuff it's exhausting and your brain is very limited in the amount of energy it can handle so you want to just limit this this detoxing work to maximum of 45 but you listen you can do seven minutes and it will work the point is to sit down each day consistently deliberately and intentionally and say okay that's the pattern I've got to find the because of, and I'm going to sit for 63 days. The second 42-day phase is only five minutes a day. You can spend longer, but it's around about five minutes a day. So it's not long. What do you do each day? You neurocycle. What is the neurocycle? The neurocycle is a five-step system. It's a system. It's a method of how you get your wise mind to talk to the messy mind and how you tune into those signals and how you bring that into your conscious mind and how you then break down, understand the interpretation, break down the processing, find the root, transfer that energy over from the toxic to the healthy. And so that's basically what you're doing. It's a system for doing that. So I've studied for years now through clinical research and, um, and tri clinical trials and, and so, so on, 38 years now, how on earth do we do this? So first I had to understand how thought formed, which I told you about how it goes through the mind and it grows and all that stuff. So that's how thought grows. Then you can literally ungrow thought in the same way. So thought grows from the root and forms the branches. You can grab the branches and you can break it down. So we see from neuroscience that as soon as I make this decision to sit down and I start by looking at the pattern, the signals like I've done, I have taken something that was suppressed and I brought it into conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. The minute something's in conscious awareness, these little branches start weakening. When these are weakening, now I can start actually seeing what's on them. Oh my gosh, I don't believe I'm worthy of a relationship. I don't think I'm, and you start seeing all these things that you see. So your wise mind is saying to your messy mind, hey, look, and it's all kind. It's all accepting. There's no judgment. Hey, you see how you're seeing yourself. That's not really the truth. Let's start unpacking that. So you are, so in, in essence, in this, in this state, you are doing the first step, which is gather. Gathering awareness. Now, notice that I'm leaning away from the tree. It's significant that I'm doing that. I'm not here. I am here. I am the, here's the wise mind. There's the messy mind. And the wise mind's holding this tree away from you. If you go to an apple orchard and you pick a tree, apples off the tree, and it's full of apples, if you go under the tree and you shake it, they're going to fall on your head and knock you out. You don't want to do that. You want to stand back and say, okay, I love that apple tree. I'm going to go up to that apple tree and I'm going to pick, and you select your apples and you put them in your basket. That's the philosophy operating here. You wise mind, hold the tree there. You sit there, messy mind. Everything's okay. You're amazing. This is not who you are. This is, you're going to be going to reconstruct this. All of that, that comes in. It's all brain preparation. And you're going to look at this tree. Now, in looking at that tree, Tim, this is where things like meditation come in. Because when you look at that tree, it's a shock. And you can go into neurochemical chaos. You can, your mind can go wild. And it can be very overwhelming. So I always recommend around about three minutes, you can do more. And, and I have an app as well called the NeuroCycle app where I walk you through a three-minute process. So as you gather awareness, before you dive in and do the five steps of the NeuroCycle, just do some sort of a meditative practice. And there's so many different types. I give examples, but you can do what you want. So two to three minutes, and you can do longer if you want, but in the actual exercise, you can do a long one and then you can come into the exercise. The exercise always starts with at least three minutes. And it can be things like havening or just closing your eyes and doing a quick meditation or um, doing a deep breathing and there's many different ways that you can do it one of my favorite is a thing called the 10 second pause which when you look at that tree you breathe in for you breathe in for three counts very deep so it's it's, it's got to be your your gut's got to move not your chest not your shoulders you breathe your, that your stomach is actually pushing out your shoulders are dropping and you're forcing that air into your lungs and then you force it out with seven counts and when you force it out, you almost have to shake your head because you'll feel high. It whooshes and forces blood to the front of your brain and oxygen. And that increases um, the decision-making ability and drops impulsivity because it changes the balance of the, the, the um, different frequencies in the brain as well as the balance between the two sides of the brain. So there's lots of little things. And if you do that 10-second pause, three or four, five or six or even nine times, it's 90 seconds. If it's 10 seconds and you do it nine times, it's 90 seconds. You have calmed down the neurochemical chaos in your brain. You've got blood flow 
beautiful blood flow going from your heart, your brain, all kinds of stuff. So that just gives you a taste. So we always get in the state and prepare our brain. Then we start the work. Okay, now I feel calmer. I feel I can do this. So I've got my basket and I'm going to gather apples. And don't try and gather all the apples in one day. Just get four for the first day. Get one emotion, get one behavioral symptom, get one body thing and get one perspective. Put that in your basket. That's the gather. And it's all very gently done. Then you go to reflect and you start reflecting. Reflection is the most one of the most beautiful things. Gather is a beautiful word as well. Because gather, I have control. Notice gather, I am controlling. I'm not being controlled. The apples aren't falling on my head. I'm controlling. Um, this whole process is embracing, processing, and reconceptualizing to find the because of. So it's a very gentle process. And that is actually how the brain and body work. It brings out the best in the brain and the body. When you reflect, when you shine a light through a prism, it goes through white and it comes out with all the colors of the rainbow. That's what reflection is. I see this one tunnel vision. There's this one apple. But what does it mean? So now reflection is to try and find the colors. It's starting to do the, getting curious. Ask, answer, discuss. Ask, answer, discuss. You grow your intelligence as you do that. So that's the second step. Then the third step and fourth step are writing steps. So you need a journal of some sort. And in my app and in the book, I recommend you get yourself a little neurocycle journal. We've got beautiful ones that are coming out as well. It'll be available soon. Um, but you're going to write down. And there's two stages of writing. Now, we all know journaling and everything is great. So there are two writing phases. The first one I call metacogging, which is where you pretty, pretty much pour your thoughts on paper in a structure that looks like a tree. And that brings the two sides of the brain together. And it draws stuff out of the non-conscious that you're not even aware of. It's a very um, almost clinical way of finding your interpretation, diving through the processing and getting to the root. And then the fourth step is to try and, is a writing step, it's called a recheck, it's to try and organize what's come out. So you start seeing all this mess coming out, this and that, and this intrusive thought here. The recheck starts looking for the patterns and the triggers. Oh, okay, it looks like this relationship issue may be because of. So you're starting to get order. And you're starting to reconceptualize. So you see, okay, well, that's not the truth. I'm not a bad person. That happened to me. So it's a, oh, I'm starting to see. So as you start seeing the roots, you can then start reconceptualizing. The minute that you are doing, doing this, this is weakening, as I've already mentioned. Energy is never lost in the brain or the body. Energy is transferred. So while I'm doing this, I'm actually starting to grow a replacement thought. So here's now a little green tree, but it's tiny. I'm starting to transfer that energy to okay, well, maybe I'm not bad. Maybe I can form. There's a reason. So I'm now starting to change what's in me. So as I progress, so then step five would be a little action. And that's an anchoring thing. The rest of the day, lots of intrusive thoughts and things sort of jump up. So now your little act of reach is going to anchor you back. And it could be something as simple as, I'm not a mess or I'm amazing or some kind of a positive statement, some kind of positive affirmation, maybe a beautiful visual of a sunset, anything, a quote, anything, a technique. It could be a little the CBT technique. So step five is the little action. You can do what you want, but it's meant to anchor you back. Then you go on. The next day you pick it up. And so you do it for 21 days. From day 42 to 63, you do the five steps, but you do it much quicker. Because by 21 days, this is actually gone, most of it. You may still have some more, but the first part is gone. You've built a new replacement thought, but it doesn't have sufficient energy to impact behavior change. But if you practice the five steps daily by day 42, it's become this. By day 63, it's become this. Now when I'm triggered, I have this strong, healthy, new pattern. I remember how I was, but this is now what's going to go into my relationship. This is now going to be, okay, I can actually form this relationship. I'm not the one always being left. I'm the one who actually tries to make things work. You know, you've reconceptualized, you're seeing it differently. You've got different energy flow, et cetera, et cetera. And that's when you start seeing sustainable changes that continue to grow very quickly in this process. The first 21 days, it's very painful. Very often, I talk about it in my, in my work as well, mm. that in the first 21 days, when you start seeing stuff that you've hidden for and suppressed for years, or you, you start seeing the because of, it's shocking. So you can get more depressed and more anxious. It doesn't mean you're getting worse. It means you're getting better. It's called the treatment effect. You've got to feel to heal the pain, the, the pain of seeing, oh my gosh, that's what happened to me. That's traumatic. You know, so you've got to allow yourself to experience those. This whole thing of suppressing emotions as illnesses is, is, is terrible for us. And emotion is a message. You've got to give yourself, you've got to grieve over what happened. 
by day 21, it's way better. And these are not fixed in, like it's more or less 21, 20, give a couple, a couple of days, but these cycles that I've tracked through the mind-brain connection. But that first 21 days is very, very, very tough. And the second 42 days is easier because you kind of seal the deal there and you work on stabilizing. Then you can come back and do another cycle. So I've had some patients that have gone through two years before they've got that relationship right or they've sorted out. So there's no cookie cutter. We just know that the that the brain changes, the neural pathways, neuroplasticity happens in cycles of 63 days. Okay, so that's a lot of information as well. <laughs> There's a lot of wisdom. That's what it is. That's very powerful. How do you know when you've located the because of the actual root cause? You will start. You will start seeing that when you start feeling that that. Um, oh my goodness, did that happen to me? When you start feeling a little bit worse, like when your anxiety and depression increases a little bit because you're starting to see what happened, that can throw you. You may even find that I've had some patients that have got so depressed at that point that they got stuck in bed for three weeks because the pain was just so overwhelming and they had to do kind of a little bit of just watch TV for a few days just to try and get their mind, give their mind a rest because it's so much to process. People mm -hmm. often experience this with EMDR as well when it starts coming up and it starts. So that's a sign. I mean, you're starting to feel kind of worse and you're starting to see detail that's also very important that you get the therapy and the support and whatever counseling coaching whatever because what i'm teaching you is a daily mind management we, yeah. we all need to do this so that's one of the signs the other sign when you're in the second phase of the 42 and you get to day 63 you'll be triggered but you're not responding how you used to you'll see a change in your behaviors your emotional social cognitive intellectual functional all your communication it's different you'll start people will say hey you're different and you'll feel, oh, I used to be like, I feel different. I'm doing this differently. I'm handling this. So it's very, very, uh, you'll, you'll really know it. You'll know it. So firstly, Dr. Caroline, just want to say thank you so much for sharing your wealth of wisdom today in 60 minutes. I mean, it was mind blowing. <laughs> um, I suppose if you were to compress what you've just dissected over the last 60 minutes into like one simple message for us to all remember, what would that simple message be? It would be this, you can't change what's happened to you, but you can change what's in you.